I know. I'm sorry. If I would have just bought a grow tent, I could have built it, hung up a light, and I'd be growing by now. I'd be out enjoying the summer sun, out on a mountain somewhere on a bike, maybe, perhaps, but I had to get fancy. That's okay. We're going to get fancy. Alternatively, I could have bought Panafilm. I did buy Panafilm. Quick pro tip, when you're installing Panafilm, grab yourself some white duct tape. You can get that at Lowe's and Home Depot. You staple through the duct tape and the panda film doesn't rip off the wall, leaving the staple behind in the drywall. But we are going to get fancy. We're going to talk about some paint that I've used in the past and the paint I'm using now that's got the highest light reflective value or LRV. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to look at some different paints and different coatings for grow rooms. I've used most of them on the market. This one here in the yellow, I'll tell you right now, it's a one part. It's worthless. Avoid it. Don't waste your time. But as far as the epoxy floor coatings go, for me, I want a clean, almost laboratory type environment. I want to be able to see bugs and dirt and debris on the floor. And, but most importantly, I want that light. I want that light reflection. You know, a lot of people that have dark floors, they are, the light's just absorbing into the floor, into heat. I saw this paint on Instagram. Miami Mango posted it. And we're going to talk about that as well. I, I saw his anecdotal experience with it. Then I saw a write-up at a website called Land of Color where they did more of a scientific analysis. And it confirmed what he knew for years and what he's been using for years. And that's what I used in this room. But before you go put on the expensive paint, I'm doing air quotes right now, expensive paint, you got to seal up the drywall. I use PVA for that. PVA is a primer that's got a little glue in it that seals up the pores of the paper. It seals up the mud and it's very inexpensive. It gives you a nice shell or a nice coating so you can start to put your pigmented color or your higher end paints on there. And for that, we're gonna be using the Bare Ultra Premium. Skip this contractor coat, it's worthless. You spend more in paint than you do in savings. The Bare Ultra Premium Eggshell, that's it. That's the answer, the video's over. Benjamin Moore, awesome paint. Sherwin-Williams, awesome paint. This is the best for a grow room. Why eggshell? It has to do with the same reason you don't use mirrors in the grow room for reflecting light. It's a thicker sheen and it causes light to refract and absorb slightly more than eggshell. It is a little bit uh, more difficult to clean an eggshell than it is a satin or a semi-gloss, so personal preference, but uh, I'm going to go for high performance here. One coat of the PVA and two coats of this Ultra Pure Bare did it for me and I did the ceiling and everything. It's incredibly reflective. I think it's gonna work out really nice for me. I know Panda Film be a hell of a lot easier. That's what I've always used in the past and that's totally fine. You can wipe it down, etc. But I believe that this is gonna give me the look I'm looking for, for filming, for making these videos and the performance I'm looking for around and under the grow light, around the canopy, but also light that spills outside of where I want it. It's gonna hit something white. It's gonna bounce back and I think it's gonna be fantastic. Now for the floors. I've installed just about every kind of floor epoxy on the market. My dad and I, we did some PPG industrial coatings back in the day for shops. I've done the Benjamin Moore. I've done the Valspar. I've done the Quick Seal. The Rust-Oleum stuff that you get from the hardware store, it's fine, but it's not that pure. It's not that uncut dope, that 100% solids epoxy. It starts as 100% solids. Then they add xylene and other thinners so that they can give more value to the customer so you can fit your car and your wife's car in the garage. For me, 100% solids or nothing, Benjamin Moore, Coratech. It's the best I've used. I've installed a lot, it's the best I've used. There may be something better in a PPG line at twice the price point, but for this, in that Home Depot price point, under $200 for a kit, which is, that's where this is, 180 bucks for a two gallon kit, it is phenomenal. It holds up to acetone, alcohol, paint thinner, brake fluid cleaner, and it's white. But with any floor coating system or any paint system, prep work is like 80% of the battle. You got to prep that floor. For me, I had this carpet adhesive that was, that was under this carpet, and uh, that had to come up. It wasn't too big of a deal. Little, this little time lapse here is about a 45-minute job, just scraping it up on my hands and knees, a little elbow grease, but no biggie. Then I went ahead and abraded it with some 60-grit sandpaper. Now, this Coratech does call for a primer for concrete and other surfaces, but for wood, like this wooden subfloor, we can go right on top of it. I didn't want to take the $180 gamble, so I did go ahead and prime it with some boat primer. There's no specific product you have to use. 
Coratec is xylene based. So I just looked for a primer that was xylene based. That's the solvent you used to clean it up. So that's what I used here. And just kind of got a fresh coat of primer over. It looked like there was a previously some kind of epoxy on the subfloor or sealant on the subfloor. So that's kind of the stage that I got it to. I got the walls painted first, you know, so I'm not dripping latex paint on my brand new epoxy floor. I already did that in my workshop over at Chilled. Uh, I got it taped up around the, the edges, around the baseboards, and went ahead and hit it with primer, let that dry for a couple days, and then got it ready to lay the epoxy. When you're prepping for epoxy, there's no level of too clean or too prepared. I mean, if you even wanted to get a tack cloth uh, that you use for automotive paint and go uh, wipe down the floor for that, if you wanted to wear a hairnet, which actually a hairnet would be a good idea, and if you got a beard, you're going to want to shave it. I mean, I'm sorry, I hate to say that, but if you got a mustache or beard, you're going to want to shave it because uh, I got a little peach fuzz growing here and uh, some of it ended up in the epoxy floor uh, that I had to tweeze out. So uh, that wasn't fun. But uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the materials that you would need for any epoxy floor system. So right out of the gate, you're going to need a mixer. I use this red helical mixer here. I purchased it from Lowe's for a few bucks in the paint department, and it does a nice job of using a hand drill or a battery powered drill to mix viscous paints and epoxies without bringing a lot of air bubbles into the mix. Uh, some kind of roller. I like these little rollers for cutting in. Uh, a phenolic roller is preferred. Spike shoes. Uh, I'd say probably that's the number one game changer if you ever laid a, a large surface area of flooring. Uh, epoxy flooring without these uh, you know that you get a good workout in that cord and you need to have a lot of long poles uh, for your rollers and stuff I purchased these on Amazon for about 17 or 18 bucks and they're invaluable they're designed for concrete flooring so if you have a wooden subfloor like me uh, you're gonna want to file down these tips to like a ball point so that you don't go live on Instagram step in for a demonstration and pierce your perfectly prepared subfloor live in front of 100 people so uh invaluable you know knee pads uh, are nice for like cutting in the edges we'll talk about cutting in the edges i purchased some uh new cartridges for the respirator uh the pink ones are the chemical ones so those uh are, are pretty nice to protect your lungs xylene is the appropriate solvent that the data sheet calls for using other solvents like acetone and paint thinner will leave you with a gummy mess so use the appropriate solvent if it's xylene use xylene mixing cups are nice this particular epoxy system is a two to one so that's easy math uh-uh don't use these chip brushes i used one that's all i had i used one i spent twice the amount of time picking out the bristles so you know hey we all make mistakes but uh, uh i knew better but i did anyway a notched rubber trowel got this from amazon as well this is for when you do the initial pour out of the epoxy the mixed epoxy this helps you kind of spread it to a more manageable um thickness so you can back roll it and finally a depth gauge. This is not the appropriate depth gauge. This is for tile, but um, it'll kind of get you in the ballpark. The data sheet calls for a 10 mil thickness or 10 micron thickness. Too thick is the number one way to, to ruin a two-part epoxy. Um, epoxies don't dry, they catalyze. And when you put them on too thick, they can't catalyze. It leaves you with molten lava underneath and, and this really gooey, gummy floor that never fully catalyzes. Ruins the floor, you got to redo it. So I'm going to do a two day installation here. According to the data sheet, they want you to mix the full amount. Uh, I guess they assume customers aren't capable of doing a two to one mix. Uh, I am. So I mixed a small amount, uh, less than a pint and cut in my edges. I didn't do this on the shop installation that I had previously done. And it was a mistake because the epoxy sort of curls off at the baseboards. I didn't want that because I, I'm doing this for water sealant purposes. So cutting in, I did about a two or three inch cut in on the edge, kind of using it as a caulk to kind of come up the baseboard a little bit and then wait 24 hours. Well, now moment of truth time. And if it looks like I'm walking like I have hemorrhoids or something here, that, that's not the case. I cured that up months ago. I just didn't want to pierce any more holes in my wooden subfloor uh, live on Instagram when I was doing this little demonstration here. So I've got about a gallon mixed up and the plan is I've cut everything in. I've done all the detail work first and now I'm just going to lay glass. Okay. Just going to go for one full coat. You got to work kind of quick with this stuff. Of course I didn't hear, but it's pretty cool. Um, but you, you do have to work quick. So you want to basically just get it on the floor and spread it out. Here we go. Okay. Push it forward. We got a little dry spot there. That's okay. Keep pulling it, keep pulling it, keep working it, keep doing it, keep pulling it, keep working it. 
Ah, there you go. There we go. Okay. Now we're pulling this out thin. Like I said, the plan is I cut in yesterday. Today we're going to do a we're going to do a full coat at the 10 mil. Okay. Okay. Ooh. Okay. I am detecting an increase in viscosity. Okay. That means we got to stop farting around and we got to get to some squeegee and boy. Okay. Let me just get my bald spot over here in the critical moisture zone. It's going to be super wet over here all the time. That's kind of primarily where I'm going to be working. It's going to be my station. So after two days of letting it dry, I'm pretty happy with it. I, I would rate myself an eight out of 10. If I was doing this for money for a client or something like that, um, I don't think it would be quite good enough. I made a couple mistakes. I should have been thinking of the final layer as like a clear coat for furniture or a clear coat for automotive or a car. You got three days to work with this self-leveling epoxy. That's 72 hours of chemical adhesion. Day one, cutting in, that was good. Day two, I should have gone back in and fixed any little cracks in the floor, any low spots. I should have done like a superficial layer and, and sort of getting myself a foundation that was um, all solid. And then finally on day three, laid my final coat. Um, Instead, what I did was laid the final coat on day two and went back and touched up. When you do that sort of thing, this particular epoxy and possibly others, you end up with a little bit of an orange peel effect that you can see really only in the reflection from the lighting on the ceiling. Um, and you can see it here in this shot. It's a little bit of an orange peel effect where I tried to touch it up and feather it in. I'm not saying you can't touch this stuff up, but if you're going for that premium look, you may want to tape the area off that you're going to touch up. Then you'll be left at least with like a few hard lines as opposed to a whole bunch of orange peel where you where you try to kind of feather it in. It, it just simply doesn't feather. If there's a major mistake, you can abrade the surface, wait about three, four or five days or a week, abrade the surface, and you can lay a whole thin layer, maybe five or 10 mils and, and get that glass. And I could still do that if I was trying to achieve perfection, like if I was charging something somebody for this. But now I'm getting a little antsy. It's time to kind of get into some of the more fun stuff, some of the electrical stuff. Uh, we talked about installing a mini split, so I want to get into that. And then one of the next couple of videos and start talking about the gear. I mean, we're all gearheads here. We all got to buy this stuff. So, uh, you know, talk about where we can get a mon get a, a carbon filter that isn't sold by uh, Hawthorne Group Monsanto. So uh, we got to get into some stuff like that if you care about that sort of thing. And then of course, a uh, big topic in this series is, is going to be the lighting. I can't wait to, to get into the lighting and spec this out. So thank you guys for being patient with me and the gap between volume one and volume two. That, it wasn't int intentional. It's just summer and a lot going on. I'm going to try to get them out a little quicker now that I've got a little bit more backlog of footage and, and the work's done, the room's done. It's more topical rather than these huge, you know, uh, 15, 20 hours of work, film it and then edit it. So uh, thanks for sticking with me here. This is Grow Mouse for Grow House Volume 2. I hope you stay tuned for Volume 3. Thanks for watching.